Thank you for joining us today for the Photosynthetic Antenna Research Center Seminar Series. We're very pleased to have uh, as our speaker today, Derek Needswicki, who's a research scientist here at WashU and manager of the Park Ultrafast Laser Facility. He's going to tell us more about the facility's capabilities and discuss some of his uh, recent results. Derek has a Master of Science and PhD in Physics with specialization in Biophysics from the Mar uh, Maria Curie Sklodowska University, <laughs> is that about right, in Lublin, Poland. <clears throat> and then in 2004, Derek came to the U.S. and uh, was a postdoc in Harry Frank's lab uh, in the Chemistry Department at the University of Connecticut. And he did some beautiful work with Harry. Uh, mostly uh, focused on carotenoid photophysics. And um, then he came here in 2009 and joined my group as a uh, research scientist and uh, also worked on uh, photophysical studies of antenna complexes of various sorts. Um, in 2010, he accepted the position of the director of the laser facility here at, in Park, and he now studies the photophysical properties of photosynthetic pigments and antenna complexes using time-resolved optical spectroscopies, femtosecond transient absorption, picosecond time-resolved fluorescence, and time-correlated single photon counting fluorescence. So, Eric, welcome. Okay, so, uh, so my presentation will be mostly about uh, capabilities of our ultra-fast laser facility and that would be sort of the presentation I gave on the all-hands meeting and, and actually it is enriched with some uh, recent projects and I know that not all of you joined this all-hands meeting or you are just new people in the park or you are visitors that, do, that are not really connected with the project so I'd like to go through all the instrumentations we have over here and just give some details and uh, how we can how we can use it for something uh, what we are interested in. So I decided to split my seminar to two different parts. So part number one will be mostly about you know, uh, technical issues. Also uh, the lasers, the spectrometers and what they can do, what they cannot do. So second, you know, it's, it's Sometimes it's quite easy to record the data, but it's not easy to understand them. So I, co I call the second part, I recorded the data and then what? <laughs> so I did like a just highlight of one representative project. So from the beginning to the end, from the data to the final model that explains it. So let's start. So that's the final layer of our facility. Uh, the final doesn't mean that it's permanent because we have some freedom of moving all the equipment around the table. Now this is at this moment like what you see on the screen. So we have, if you look at the left part of the of the screen in that L shape, uh, the two part with this uh, eye given in the boxes is the laser system that feeds two actually, three different instruments on the right part of the, of, the, of the table. So over here, I will just go through all of them. Over here we have something what we call one box, actually what factory calls, one, co one box ultrafast amplifier. So it's like a big box with, uh, with two lasers, in it and other stuff that we, we need to use to generate the wavelength or the laser pulse that we use to feed our transient absorption spectrometer. So I will just go through all of the parameters what characterizes uh, what characterizes this and uh, uh, this setup. So the box contains fully automated my type HP, so it's a high power, just this femtosecond to enable oscillator that is used to seed our uh, amplifier. This is also built in, in, the, in the unit. 
it contains also an power diode solid, solid state pulsed green laser and that we use to pump the, the amplifier and also there's, there are two, two more boxes hidden under the cover that's a pulse stretcher and compressor and of course the most important part of it the regenerative amplifier so what we can get out of the box is the, the beam that has the uh, characteristics as the, 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 the wave is centered at 800 nanometers and the repetition rate is fixed to 1 kilohertz. Uh, however, we can, we can change the repetition rate, but our transient absorption spectrometer is designed just for that one, so it's not necessary. What is nice, we have plenty of power coming out of the box, so it's a 3.5 millijoules. This is quite a lot. I used to work at the um, systems that used to like 1 millijoules, and it was fine. So even if something goes wrong, go, go, goes wrong and we, we lose the power, we still have some you know, uh, excessive amount that we can use and don't worry about you know, losing ability to measure anything. And the pulse width, which is really important because that defines us like the resolution of our instrumentation, it's around 90 femtoseconds and it's a quite good actual. So that box you can see on the bottom, on the right part, on the picture. And the smaller box on the left side, that's top as C, that's automatic for PA. So actually, you know, we can get only one wavelength out of the box. So we need to use this wavelength to generate another wavelength that we want to use for the excitation of our samples. So that's why we need this RPA. RPA just means that it's optical parametric amplifier. So <coughs> using just one wavelength on the input, which is shown here, in this line, oh, you can see yeah. over here, you can get a quite broad range of the excitation pulses out of the LPA. And actually, that one gives us the opportunity to uh, generate everything between 190 nanometers and 2 microns. And this is quite good. It's really good, I, think, I have to say. So, so that part we use just for transient absorption spectrometer. So let's go back to the scheme. So here is our transient absorption spectrometer. So this is Helios. Helios is made by some uh, well-known in this business company, Ultrafast Systems. And here on the left, you can see something what they provide in the factory flyer, but our version on the bottom of the picture over here it's uh, way way more complicated. So we have we have two detectors that are used for two different spectrum ranges, one for visible, second for uh, near infrared. We have also much longer uh, stage to provide the delay between pump and, and prop beams and it's so long that it cannot be fit inside the box, so it's actually outside. You can see that one is short and it's in, in the box. So, like you can see, it's configured to prop transient spectral regions 400, 800 nanometers with wide width resolution 1.5 nanometer and the NIR range from 800 to 1600 nanometers. And unfortunately, the resolution is a little bit lower, 3 nanometers here. So, the temporal window, so that yeah. what delay times we can measure between pump and the prop. So this unit has 8 nanoseconds delay maximum and it's it's really good actually. I used to work on the same instrument, I mean not the same, the previous version that had only 1.6 nanometer, a nanosecond. And sometimes it was not enough to record some signals. So here probably all you can imagine, you can imagine. So the temporal resolution of the instrument is actually defined by the company and they claim that's in 1.4 multiplied by the laser duration. So in our case it will be around 120 to 130 femtoseconds. So and here it's a problem. So if you can if you'd like to measure some processes that take occur in time scale like 20, 
drift it into a second from that, it would be impossible to resolve them from the, uh, another component. So they will be just hit, they will be just buried under the instrument response function. However, the in phase different temporal resolution is very good. It's seven femtoseconds. So if we go down with the laser, for example, we do some upgrade in future and we have that one five feet femtosecond laser that is quite possible. Then these are some you know incredibly uh, abilities to go down with the uh, with the resolution to almost you know this what is possible to reach this seven And it works in this step scanning so that you can manipulate with this from the software level and the smallest step you can reach is 20 femtoseconds. So it's very precise instrument. So as I said, it's controlled from the software, and that's like a snapshot how it looks. It's not really complicated. It's very very friendly to use. <laughs> okay, so let's go back to this. Thing. So the second part of the laser setup, it's over here. So that's an OPO, which is different from OPA, and the difference is that that's an oscillator. So for that, we use the fundamental beam from the oscillator, from this my type oscillator, which is hidden in the uh, source size bo box. And that means that instead of 1 kilohertz, what we use for transient absorption, we use just 8 megahertz frequency for OPA. Sometimes it's too fast, and we need to slow down, say, which is not really correct, but uh, we need to slow down with this frequency before because we have some long standing signals, for example, to measure. And we just overexcite the sample if we keep this frequency so high. So, for that reason, we use this pulse selector that we got from spectrophysics, and it's one, it works quite well. And from 80 megahertz, you can go down with the excitation probe, uh, sorry, pulses. A few kilohertz even, and still gives, still, 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 still have some signals to record on the uh, on our equipment, which is this time corrected single photon counting or uh, step camera system. So let me give some information about this <coughs> instrumentation. So it can cover quite broad range. You can see it's from three, four, to five to uh, meter to 2.5 micrometer, and there is no gap between the signals. So probably it's it's enough to most of the transitions we want to excite in our samples appear in the visible or analog region. So we can use it for almost everything we can imagine. <coughs> and there is opportunity that we can use like simultaneous. Uh, signals on the output on the on the OPO, which is not really good visible on the small picture, but they are over here. So you can, for example, use like the second second order of the fundamental beam, which is like in the UV somewhere around. It depends what we use to feed because there is some flexibility of the feeding uh, wavelength for this OPO. So we can use at the same time, for example, UV output and visible output. Just it's hard to imagine at that point what kind of, uh, let's say, experiments we can do with two simultaneous excitation at the same time. And what we have in the lab is a semi-automated version. So it's not like hands-free that you just push the button and all works. Actually, sometimes we use a lots of effort to set what you really want. And what you see on the picture is you know, it's a nice blue cover and box. So it's like I call it behind the scene. I can see what's actually inside the box. And they say they say it's quite scary in the first view. So so here is our laser setup and for sure I said about transient absorption let's say about something about fluorescence nighttime setup. So we have two of them. One is just time priority single photon, which is 
very basic and it's just for probing the kinetics. Second is the system base of the universal strip camera and in this case from Hamamatsu photonics. So what it measures, it measures just not the one, for example, or one or just few wavelengths and only compressed to one, kinet one kinetics, but it measures like an image of your fluorescence. So you can you can say it's like 2D measurement. You can get the decay at the many, many wavelengths at the same time. And, and so some, some basic information about that. So this instrument is very different from what I said before. So we measure fluorescence, we don't, change, we don't measure the transmitters and stuff, nothing like that. And because, so it depends what kind of, what, what time regime you have to use for your samples. You have to change the hardware in this unit. So there are something what is called sleeping units. And it, it, it depends in what temporary, in what time window we are, we have to uh, configure each of the very specific uh, experiments we are doing at this moment. So one is just designed and it's called SWAT, fast sweeping unit for measurements in time domain one, uh, 0 to 160 picoseconds. Second can be easy you know, arranged and we can measure signals that persist in the time domain like 1 nanosecond, 1 millisecond. So you can imagine that you know, we can measure fast fluorescence or we can even measure very slow phosphorescence. And the resolution of this instrument is defined by company to be 2 picosecond in this you know, uh, 160 picosecond time window. However, I've never got so good. Um, in my opinion, it's around 10 picosecond. And it's equipped with the spectrometer, so the spectrograph over here, this box, but you can go and see from Rooker, and also the sample chamber, which is on the, another part of the, of the system over here. And the strip tube is actually hidden inside the box. And the unit small box over here, what you see is just the CCD camera that monitors the screen, the phosphor screen. So just the light coming from the phosphor. And, and actually it is hands-free, so it's fully operated from the software level. So the last unit we have, that's time correlated single photon counting. And that's the unit we decided just to build from scratches. Not exactly from scratches, but sort of. And so, based on the <coughs> uh, tabletop system from German company Hicken, Hicken, Becker and Hick, sorry. And they call it Simple Time 130. So 130 is just the, the name of the model they incorporate in this box. And it's just one channel, one channel model, so it means that you can simultaneously measure just one kinetic. Depends also what the sneaking amount of matter is. Because the progress in the field is so, so fast that you can buy the unit that has many, many channels, like 16, whatever. And you can see, you can measure like 16 kinetics at the same time. Of course, you don't have to. You can use monochromator for that, but you have to buy also spectrogram. So our unit is equipped with the monochromator, which is an automated version of the Euler Cornerstone 130 version. And the layout, what we have in the lab, looks like in the picture on the bottom. And actually, it's not a good photo. So if you really want to see it in the, you know, how it really looks, I invite you to the lab. You can see. So that's how our lab looks right now. And recently we have some new accessories also. And the most important is our cryostat. So we got liquid nitrogen cryostat from American company Janice. And it looks exactly like on the left side of that. So you can see that it designed to work not only at the temperature of liquid nitrogen, but we have 
temperature controller and we can set the temperature in the broad range. You can see it here, so it's from 65 to 325 Kelvins. So we can do some uh, like temperature dependent measurements of uh, maybe you have something in your mind, so it's not a problem. And the cross thing is equipped with the vacuum pump and the vacuum pump is from fiber. So that's what we have in our lab now, and all of them, what you see, are working right now. So here I just give a brief summary of the capabilities of the instrumentation. So trident absorption. I just joined together the, the instrument plus the, 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 the uh, information, some basic information about the laser, what we use for that unit. So we can we can we can uh, probe the signals in the spectral range for 100, 1600 nanometers. The, yeah, somebody can ask what kind of signals, how, how big the signals must be if we want to record them. So we see that we have no problem if the delta A change in the absorbance is like 1 to minus 10. So 10 to minus 3, and it's not a problem to measure that one. So we have exceptional selectivity of the wavelength that we use to excite our sample, and that's between 300 nanometers to hyper and, and strength. So the temporal resolution of the instrument is around, I get like 120 over there. So 120, 140, it depends sometimes a little bit from the pulse quantity at, the, at this day. So the temporal coverage of the instrument from 0 to 8 nanoseconds. The minimum temporal st step size of the instrument 20 femtoseconds. And, and also we have like software that is provided especially for that data what is uh, recorded on the instrument and you can do some fancy manipulation of the data and fitting, including some global fittings, stuff like that. So the fluorescence lifetime and spectral imaging system. So it's a strip camera with some information about the laser that we use for the laser pulses, what we use for that instrument. So also, it's <coughs> we have like a red extended version, which is actually even cooled red extended version of the uh, split tube, so we can measure fluorescence, phosphorescence, and uh, in the spectral range 490 nanometers. We have three different gradients in the spectrograph, so if the dispersion is very important for you because, for example, you want to focus just on one peak in your broad fluorescence spectrum, we can do it. And like before, we have this exceptional selectivity in the wavelength for the exciting pulse and excitation pulses. So in this case, it's not so not so good right there, but mostly I would say that uh, 300, 900 nanometers, no problem. Temporal resolution, like factor is 200 because I would say 10. Temporal coverage from 0 to, to 1 millisecond time. Um, and we have this flexibility in the frequency of the exciting laser because of this pulse speaker unit. So, and the last unit, this time product is in the photon setup. And so we can measure emission up to 8, 70 nanometers, and we can actually acquire the data with the native frequency from the oscillator, so it's 8 megahertz, so it's like one second down. And temporal resolution in this case, it's around 200 picosecond, which is quite good still. So that's all about equipment. Now, let's focus on some data. So as a representative project, I just sent him what I did recently together with David Bina, which is sitting on the door. That's a transient absorption spectroscopy of the two spectral forms of the light harvesting complex to commonly related to LH2 from other chromatic emails. So first, what are we talking about? So because not a lot of us are familiar with this biological stuff. So this is the anoxygenic purple bacteria uh, that usually lives in places like ponds, lakes, stagnant bodies, 
fresh water lagoons and the salt water also. But in the environment that is that is rich in salt sulfide. And it's also exposed to the light. And if we look at the phylogenetic tree, probably I used the correct name, I'm not sure about that. We see this species over here. And the closest relatives to it are our chromatium nutisinium and thermochromatium tepinium, for example, what I spent lots of my time in the last two years here also. And I see some really similar similarities between them. So the LH2, there is uh, probably hundreds of paper, papers about LH2. I see this uh, <coughs> me, as this light for the complex that, that the role of this complex is just to harvest the light and transfer it to LH1 and then to our reaction center. So until now we have like two crystal structures that are really good defined for LH2. One is from Redopseudomonas acidophila that is non for palpobacterium. And that, structure, that, that, that crystal structure actually was obtained by Richard Cogdell and I presented here. And like you can see there are only two different photosynthetic pigments built in the protein. One is keratinoid. I mean, in case of that LH2 that's rather in glucoside, here it's orange, here it's uh, yellow. And two different spectral forms of bacterial chloroquine A. One, what is called B800, and that's the ring over here. In case of this LH2, that's uh, uh, nine pigments in monomeric, in monomeric forms just a line around the sample in the middle of the, this transmembrane protein. And the second form, it's a commonly called V850 pair. It's supposed to be red and gray, but it's, it's not red over here. And they are over here. So this arrived, this, oh, sorry. So, the spectral properties of the LH2, and this is the spectrum of the acidophila taken at 10K, are, as you can expect, they origin from this pigment. So I will just say roughly, uh, shortly about all the bands, absorption, absor absorption band you can see in this spectrum. So the band around 500, 500 nanometers, it origins from the carotenoid. All others origin from the bacterial chlorophyll A. So we have soil band, we have two X band, what I didn't mark, sorry. And we have two bands, that's 800, that comes, that's a QY transition from this monomeric form of the bacterial chlorophyll A. And 850 band, this is from this exotonically coupled pair of the, uh, of the pigment. And the names are just from that. that they appear at the 800 and 850 nanometers. So, so let's look at the LH2 from our alochromatic binosum. And here it's a comparison of that. So on the top we have acidophila, middle and bottom, two different spectral forms of the alochromatic binosum. And however, the spectra are not taken at the same temperature. 10K versus this other K. But it's not a big difference, I can tell you. But even if you go down to 10K, it will be just a slightly different between, between a slight, a small difference between 77 and 10K uh, profiles. So you can see that acidophila, the spectrum is, you can see that this, the, the spectrum tells you that this protein is very homogeneous in, in terms of pigments, organization. In composition. So, nicely resolved band from carotenoid means that there is just one carotenoid incorporated to it. And if, you will, if, we, if we look at the binosum, we see that it's more complicated. So, there's no nice vibronic separation. That means we have 
Morbid one keratinized in there. And actually, the composition of them changes. So at the highlight, we see that the band shift to the shorter wavelength compared to low light form. Also, there is something going on in the Q1 region of the lateral curvature. And we can see that we have something like a split of B850, sorry, B800 band at high, high light form. And actually, there's not just one 800 peak. Oh, there are two, so it's like 790 and 808. So the separation between them is quite big, it's like 20 nanometers. But at, in low light form, there's just one peak, and that appears about 808 also. So, what is known so far about the pigment composition from this LH2? But there are three different paradigms, and they are rhodopene anhydrorhodolibrin and spirosantin. And the major difference between them is that they have different number of uh, conjugated double carbon-carbon bonds in the, in the chain. And that, that defines actually the spectral properties of them. So the longer conjugation, the more red shift the spectrum will be. So you can see that the difference in the spectrum for rhodopene and spirosantin is like 20 nanometers, so from 505 it goes to 525 visual. And the same happens actually here. So we can say that in the highlight form, the most common carotenoid from all three forms will be rhodopene. In low light form, that will be not spirosina, unfortunately, but anhydrodopone. So there is some, maybe there is some reason why this bug prefers one carotenoid in the very specific light condition. Also, there's a question of why there's a split in this form. <coughs> so, if you look at the spectrum, you can see that oh, it's just a small change in the spectrum. But, if you look at the sample on your eye, you can see that it's eye detectable. You can see the change of color very easily. So, on the left side, you have highlight form. On the right side, it's a low light form. And probably LH2 from this bacterium is a little bit different from what we know for non sulfur bacteria. So you can see that the LH2 from this bug, what I, saw, what I showed before, acidophila, it's like 9 nine While the AFM study shown that most probably the LH2 for our commercial mechanism will be. 13 mark. So it's something like an intermediate between LH1 and LH2. That's maybe why it's so complicated. So now when we, when we, when we see our samples, and we have a few questions we can try to answer by doing some measurements in our lab. So one question would be, is there any particular reason of the observed change of the carotenoid composition? And what is excited energy path? Uh, what's the range of the activation of the excited energy in the LH2? And is it different in both of them, for example? And another one is the highlight, highlight form of this LH2 just simple a mixture of two different spectral forms of, uh, of the B850, B800, B850 uh, complex that has this 800 bands just shifted to 790 and second, in second form to 808. And they are so similar from the biochemical point that we cannot just separate them in the, in the procedures what we use so far. Or maybe it's a real, real split of this peak that occurs from one protein. So maybe the protein is not homogeneous and we have different alpha, beta subunits and they differently bind this 800 pigment in the ring. And actually we have just two different spectral forms that are randomly put in the, in the ring. Who knows? But maybe you know, something what we measure can answer this question. So first, if you want to understand what is the role of carotenoid in the LH2 
we need to do like comparative studies. So we need to measure the pigment, which is in environment different to the H2, and uh, that will not affect anything. So like a solvent. So it's just one pure protein, pure uh, molecular molecule, sorry. And then we can the, me the measurements what we what we obtain, we can compare to the same what we see if we excite this pigment, for example, in LH2. And the difference between them will tell us many things about what it does in there. So let's let's try to understand, for example, rather pin raw or the pin in LH2 of the of this in this uh, bacteria. So here it's a rhodopin measured in, and that's a transient absorption, of course. So that's a rhodopin measured in the solvent. In this case, uh, that's a benzene. And because benzene has very high refractive index, it shifts this absorption spectrum over here to the place where it appears in the LH2. So we can say that the environment is quite similar to LH2 protein, but there are no other factors like other pigments around. <coughs> so when we excite the pigment by providing this light, sorry, this is the scale over here is in uh, wave numbers, and I forgot to put it, so I'm sorry. So you can imagine that this peak over here will be about 5.5 millimeters. So we can excite this molecule and then see what happens after. Because so far we know about all almost carotenoids that the, the, the coloration that is provided by this broad absorption band is associated with the electronic transition from the ground state to the second excited state. And the transition to the first one actually is forbidden because there are very specific selection rules for that. And that's actually very interesting because you can imagine that <coughs> then state, the energy of the state will depend also from the <coughs> conjugation of the molecule. So in one case, this state can serve as energy donor to, for example, chlorophyll molecules in different light harvesting complexes. But if the conjugation is long enough, you can go below QY transition, for example, and can serve like an energy acceptor instead of gamma. So, but first we need to define what that S1 energy is, because if you cannot measure the absorption, how can you define? So there's no absorption, there's no emission, but there's a way to avoid that problem. So, what happens when we excite the sample? The S2 state is well, it's very short. It's like 100, 200 femtosecond depends on this conjugation in the molecule. Then within, within this time frame, we can catch the transition from the S2 occurring somewhere, somewhere to higher excited state. And we just call them SN because we don't really know what they are. It could be a combination of many of them. And that transition is really occurs in the NIR region. So that's the blue over here. So we excite the molecule, we see that it bleaches, so we call it S0, S2 bleaching because we deplete the ground state, so the transmittance of the sample will be higher in the prop than in the pump. And, and this bleaching shows up simultaneously with this transient absorption in the energy. Then after like 200 femtoseconds, one is gone, it's blue. And then two other transitions try to uh, will show up simultaneously also. And that's this one over here, the red trace, and one over here, the red trace. And what is now that this highly energetic one over here with the sharp, usually it's very sharp, that's called S1SM. So from the S1, there's a transition to some excited state which is in higher in energy and has the symmetry that allows this transition to happen but it's not well defined what it is but the second transition it's what we exactly want to see it's s1 
to S2. So we have, at this point, we have two transitions well defined, S0, S2, and S1, S2. So it's very easy to get the gap between them that will define as S1 energy. So for rhodopine, that would be in weight numbers 12,450 that could be converted to nanometers, it's 8 of kilometers. And, <coughs> and also S1 energy would be the same in the protein because it doesn't change with the environment. So now we can look again and see what happens if we excite this vibronic band, this one, of the S2 state of rhodopine in the LH2 and see what changes we see between transient absorption in the solvent and in LH2. So mostly what you want to see are the changes in the lifetimes of the excited states. So we want to measure the change in the lifetime of S2 and S1. So the problem with lifetime of S2 state is, is already very close to the resolution of our instrument, even in the solvent. So, if in LH2 there is energy transfer from this state to, for example, Qx band of bacteriotrophin, that there is a good metric for that, there will be shortening of the lifetime. So, it will go way, way below the resolution of the instrument. So, we cannot really say what the lifetime actually is. There are some studies done using much better uh, lasers in case of the host duration. And People usually want to measure that this, the lifetime of the S2 state in LH3 is around 50, 60 femtoseconds versus 200 femtoseconds in the cell. But for us, it could be quite easy to see the differences in the lifetime of S1. So here we have, we have the spectra that are sort of the same representation, what we see over here. Just they are taken at the specific delay times. So you can see that we have mostly the same. We have this bleaching of the ground state. We have this S1, Sn transient absorption peak. We have this small S1, S2 transient absorption. Here they are normalized just to you know, enhance the visibility for, for you. And we have something additional here. So if you look at back at the steady state spectrum, we see that we have bleaching of the P850 and small bleaching of B800. So that means that even if you excite just carotenoid specifically, you have bleaching of bacterial chloride. So it's an indication that there is energy transfer from one molecule, carotenoid, to another one, bacterial chloride. So now we have the data, and we can do very specific fitting. So we can use all the data together and just go about the fitting using a model we'd like to apply for that reason. Sometimes it's very difficult to choose the model. Um, usually people use the model what I provided here. It's just you assume that you excite one molecule and it goes permanently to another state that could be still in the same molecule, another, another, could be another molecule. But there is no way back. And the, the spectral profiles, what you get from this fitting, people use, say, to they are EADs from evolution associated different spectra. So even if they don't really give the perfect picture of the molecular species associated with the individual transitions, you still have something very useful, the lifetimes. So based on that, if you have lifetimes of this sort of molecule, uh, excited states in LH2, in the solvent, you can build the model. What it does in the LH2. So here I just put like a scheme in the energy. Uh, so you can see it's like Q1, Qx bands, the S1 and the S2 state of carotenoid. And based on the differences in the lifetimes, you can say what's the branch between the, these molecules. So it looks like that if you want to estimate the energy transfer efficiency from each of the states, the numbers would be like on the scheme. So 13% of the excitation provided to S2 will be 
transferred at once from S to, to QA must be QX band of the material chromatin. It's hard to define which one because of both B and habit of being with the bleach at once. But uh, so I just uh, simplified the thing and I provided this transfer just to one of the molecules, B and T. So 70% will go to S1, and there is also something like that, like a not the bright, ironically relaxed uh, form of the S1 as a hot S1. 17% will be transferred to something which is called S1, and people believe that's a, uh, it's like a precursor of the triplet formation for cartonol. And then, based on the differences in the lifetime of S1 state, we can say that there's a 40-50% of that that is convert, transferred to the QI band of the B850. And it must be B850 because the S1 energy is already lower by the transition related to the QI of the B800. So now we have the picture what carotenoid does in this highlight form. Now we can focus why we see the splitting. And is it two different molecules? I mean, two different proteins? Or is it just one protein and uh, two different spectral species? sitting in it. So you can imagine that if you excite the, the blue band side this way <coughs> at 790, that appears at 790, and if they don't talk to each other, so they are in the two different proteins, they will be just bleaching of one of them and none of two. So but if there's if there's like an energy transfer between them, the bleaching of the first one will disappear and the bleaching of the second one will show up. And then will be transferred to the 850. So that's exactly what we see here. So initially we see the bleaching of the, the 790 band that goes very fast. It goes goes up very fast within one picosecond. Then the second one shows up, and then it decays, and all the tra tra all the excitation is finally to be. Then the fitting of this data will provide us with the uh, lifetimes, effective lifetimes of the individual species. And from that, we can conclude what, the, what are the rates, what the lifetimes of the rate is from the individual molecule. So we can build like the complete scheme, how this protein works as well. And it's provided over here. And I don't want to go into details. So, you can imagine we can do the same for the low light form. And here's the question is easier because we can just one 800 band. And it was that it, it works quite well, like the form, the, the, it quite the same like the high light form. And I will just jump out to the final. So here we just see the difference between them. So you can see that the, for the highlight form, the most of the excitation provided from carotenoid comes from the S1 state. That's 30% like of the total 43%. That can be measured by comparing the uh, steady state fluorescence excitation profiles with the 1 minus trans transmittance uh, that could be generated from the steady state absorption spectra. But for the low light form, there is only 9% of the excitation provided by carotenoid given to from S1 and most of it is from the, uh, sorry, it should be S2 over here. So now you see that we have the data, we can, we can imagine some, prof, some, some models, we can try to use these models and see if they work. I believe that they are not 100% accurate, but they are very close to that work actually happens in there. So that's it. And I'd like to acknowledge. So to Professor Richard Punga that provided this answers to us. To Dr. David Bina who measured the steady state stuff. So this one minus T and the excitation profiles also and absorption. And to Professor Dewey Holton and Professor Robert Bankenship, they are the bosses. So and thank you. Questions?
Mm -hmm. uh, could you just explain a couple of words? That hypothetic state that you called SN on the previous slide, what should we be here? SN? Yeah. Sorry, I have to repeat the question from that. Okay. So the question is, what's this SN state? Would it be in? That could be split into different subsets, probably, as you said. I'm just uh, slightly lost here. No, no. The, okay, so the question was, what will be the meaning of S and state here, and is it related with the splitting of B800 band? Is that correct? Correct. Okay. No, I mean, we are lost. That's what I would say. So the S and it's a, it's electronic state of carotenoid only. Uh, okay. It's just N because it's some high energy state that is not even visible in the steady state absorption because it's in the UV. And very far. And we just see this because we measure excited state absorption, and that happens to the state. But it could be a combination of many states that gives this fancy band, what we see in the TA. So it has nothing with this B800 band. So. Stay on this slide, okay. because this is a beautiful example uh, in the 800 band, where this spectroscopy allows you to distinguish between, and you said this, but I just want to kind of reemphasize mm -hmm. it, between two structural possibilities. One is that you've got some LH2s that are entirely with the, what is it, 790? Mm -hmm. form, and some that are entirely with the 805 form, and they don't talk to each other. What this says is that's not true. Yeah, they talk. That you've got mixture. Each individual complex has some of each of those two spectral forms in the complex itself. Now, can you tell from this, it looks like from this and maybe from the spectrum, that it's roughly equal amounts of the two spectral forms yeah, look like. that are there. Mm -hmm. And you can't say whether or not they're sort of alternating or the left half is one form and the right half no. is another form. That's beyond the, the like resolution of the data to see that. But you can say without any ambiguity that they are both present in individual complexes. Yes. I mean, the simple explanation of that, that if they are in the different complexes, the lifetime of the each band will be the same. Right. So in this case, it should be 1.6 picosecond. But the lifetime of the first band, it's a half of it, as well, around 800 picoseconds. So definitely, there is energy transfer from this one to another one. Yeah, if they were in separate complexes, you would never see that transfer from the 790 yes. to the 805. Yes. That would simply not happen. They were both transferred to the 850 directly. Yes. So your data is really unambiguous on that. Hopefully they are. <laughs> on that particular point. OK, thank you. Let's have some more questions. Usually, generally, yes, because the LH2 usually contains. The question. Sorry. So, so the question was, uh, is it the scheme of the energy path law in the LH2 already known? Uh, my my answer is yes, but it, it would be very different for each form of LH2 because every species has different characteristics. So you can imagine that the general idea is the same for all of them, but the details will be very different for each of them. Is it a good answer? Well, and I think this business of having the two separate B800 yeah, this is, is completely new. I mean, this, this is something this is not, new. Yeah. Not been seen before. 
I mean, this is something new because the split is not observed for the non -sold, non -sold, uh, for the LH2 from non sulfur bacteria. And most of the work is done for that. So this split shows up only for like these species when I said that like thermocromation tepidum with binosum and uh, muni, something like that. And they are not really well studied. And, and initially the, the idea was that that's a mixture of two different complexes. But now I guess that people saw that the, the genome provides that the LH2 will be not homogeneous in terms of alpha beta subunit, so they can easily create different spectral forms of the DNA molecule. More questions? He says one more. Okay. You also mentioned, and I hadn't heard this before, that the LH2 in this organism has 13 subunits? Yes. So is that? Yes. I had. Yeah, so I was really surprised. That, yeah. I thought I yeah. found this study, that's paper from 2008 from Press. Yeah. And they, they did AFM studies. And it's a result of quite good statistics of many, many, many trials. And they said there are two different, and this LH2 is in two different forms. But the most common would be the spectrum in my act. I don't know how to say it in different words, actually. So it could be quite different from what we know about LH2, which is like 9 or 8 mark in some cases. So is the low light form <coughs> uh, different size from the high light form, or is I that have not? I have no idea. They didn't even mention that you can obtain different light forms and they have different spectral properties. So they can have different sizes though. No. So I guess it's for this highlight one because I, I saw the spectrum that it provides. So most probably it's a highlight for structure. Oh sorry. We do Any have an online yeah, yeah, we have an online question. Okay, good. Mm -hmm. uh, this is from uh, Banu, I hope I'm pronouncing that right, but what is the output power of OPA? Um, it, actually, it depends on the wavelength. Could you please so, just re repeat the question? Okay, the question was, what is the output of OPA? So I just recall, I just, the OPA we use for the transient absorption spectrometer. So the wavelength, sorry, the, the, the energy of power, whatever you want to use, okay, it's very different for different wavelengths, but what we, we put like a neutral density filters just before we excite the sample. So we try to excite the sample with very low energy, like one microvolt, no more. So the intensity, I know the question, so the intensity of the laser that hits the sample is very low. Because this spot is like one nano, sorry, one millimeter, so it gives like 10 to 14, 15 photons per centimeter square per pulse. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's, there. that's my answer. Is that it? Okay, let's thank Eric again. Thank you.